Now, uh, this morning we're going to be in Psalm 110, as you can see. Um, I'm excited about this psalm because um, I get to talk about the king. Uh, last week's was a little bit of a downer, <laughs> a little bit more difficult. This week is going to be a lot more uplifting and joyful, at least for my heart. Um, so as you guys are turning there, um, when I was a kid, I loved to read the legends and stories of King Arthur. I was a nut, man. The, you know, the Excalibur, the Lady of the Lake, the Round Table, Lancelot, Duloc, all of that. I was, I was, I was like all the time reading it. Um, and one of the, the seminal works, one of the seminal tells, one of the big ones that people read about King Arthur's written by T.H. White in this book called The Once and Future King. And I love that title. I think it's super, it just sounds cool, right? Um, and the whole idea is that while King Arthur was at one time the king of England and he went away, but at, he's promised to return when England is in its, a per, in its most perilous state, he will return and, and govern again and rule again in, in, in glory and goodness. And, and I think one of the things that really drew me to the King Arthur myths is that this idea of, of, of a promised individual, this returning king, this one who is <clears throat> going to make things right, a Messiah figure, if you will, which is a trope that once you become aware of it in, li in literature is everywhere, right? This idea of this promised individual, the, you know, the matrix has Neo, you know, the one that is to come, the one that's been prophesied, the anointed one, the special one. And, and it's everywhere in, li in literature because it is everywhere in the story of God. So Psalm 110 is a messianic Psalm. In fact, Psalm 110 <clears throat> is one of the most quoted Psalms in the New Testament. We talked about last week, Psalms is the most quoted book of the Old Testament and the New Testament. And of the Psalms, Psalm 110 is one of the most quoted Psalms. In fact, Jesus uses it as a proof text for his own divinity against the Pharisees. And I love that. As before we jump into the word, let's pray to the king. God, I thank you that you are a God who is living and reigning and ruling. That you are a God who, who has promised one to us. You've delivered and you've promised to return again. And, and all those things, all those promises that we can take heart in because we know that you are not a liar. We know that you are faithful and true and that your ways do not change. God, and I pray that as we, we go through this text and we talked about, and we would talk about King Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, that, that you would be stirring in our hearts what that means, what needs to change, how we then need to respond and to live in the light of the kingship of Christ in our lives. God, we thank you for this. We thank you for your word. We pray all this in your name. Amen. You guys, ready? Psalm 110 reads, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion, your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power and holy garments from the womb of the morning. The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. I love this. As we journey through, I, the first thing I want to start out is the Lord says to my Lord, this confusing phrase, because we don't, uh, 
If you guys' Bibles, you have that first Lord, right, is going to be all uppercase. You know, that's, that's the, our way of pointing that, that that's the name of God. That's Yahweh. And so Yahweh says to my Lord, this is Adonai. This is someone who is above David. So this is a Psalm of David. And he's writing about the one that is to come after him, this promised Messiah and that God promised to him. So it's going to be from his line, but yet still above him. So the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. This idea of Jesus sitting at the right hand of God invokes the right hand is always a position of power in Hebrew. Whenever you see the, the might of your right hand or the power of your right hand, it's always power, authority. And Jesus sitting next at the right hand of God, the Father, Yahweh, is a symbol of equality. And I love that. In fact, this is a motif that we see over and over again in Scripture. In Mark 16, 19, at the ascension, the disciples see Christ rising to the spot, to the right hand of God, to be enthroned. Romans 8, 34 Paul talks about how Christ is sitting at the right hand of God, interceding for us on our behalf. In Hebrews 1 and 3, the writers, or in 1 3, the writers of Hebrews states that, that Christ is sitting at the right hand of God after making purification of sin through the work of the cross. 1 Peter 3, 22, Peter writes that Christ is enthroned with all authority over the earth and angels and demons and everything in it. Acts 2.33, Peter again talks about how Christ is exiled, or not exiled, exalted to the throne room of God, to the right hand of God, and sending the spirit to us on the day of Pentecost. Luke 2, 6 and 9, as Jesus is being tried by the Pharisees in the Sanhedrin, he, he, he quotes this, he alludes to it. He said, now, from now on, this point on, after what is about to happen, the son of man will be seated at the right hand of power. In Acts 7, verses 55 and 56, as Stephen is being stoned, he sees a vision of Christ at the right hand of God. This time, though, not sitting, but standing. And it's... It's interesting, just a position that we're not going to really dive into. In Hebrews 12 and 2, the, again, the author of Hebrew, Hebrews writes that, that it is because of the work of the cross that Christ is now seated at the right hand of God. Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 1, that because Christ is risen and exalted to the right hand of God, that then we need to focus on the things that are above, not of the things of this earth. And in Hebrews 8, the author of Hebrew reminds his people that Christ is enthroned, not just as king, but as a priest. And so one of the things we're going to talk about in our doctrines class today is who is Jesus? Who's the Messiah? And, and this is a good primer for that because one of the core identities of who Christ is, is this idea that he is the Messiah, the King, the priest King, the prophet, priest and King. I like the fact David sees Jesus sitting at the, the right hand of God because and it's important that he's sitting because sitting is a place of rest, right? If you have work to do, you're not sitting down. But Christ is seated, is seated because he has completed his work. He is waiting. What is he waiting for? For the God himself to make his enemies his footstool. All the enemies of God will be brought to subjugation. They will be brought low to serve God in the most embarrassing way possible. And all this will be accomplished through the power of God, not through armies, not through 
not through logic, but by the power of God alone. David continues that to say in verse two that the that the the reign of Christ isn't just for his people, isn't just for Israel, much like how God made an example out of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 4, reminding him that his authority stretches to the ends of the earth. David again is David before Daniel even said that. He, he's saying that the, the scepter, the authority, the power, the reign and rule of Christ is going to go out from Zion and it's going to be all over. The whole earth will, will come under the reign and rule of Christ. Amen. David then goes on to describe the armies of when that day comes. And the, the armies of God will rise up. The people of God will volunteer themselves as an army. The ESV that I read doesn't quite do an, a great example of pulling this language in, but the Hebrew has this idea as the Lord of hosts, right? This armies, these are the armies of God that will volunteer to serve him. And, and these armies, because the womb of the morning is such a easy to understand visual right but these armies are going to be strong and courageous and glorious and holy verse 4 david states the lord has sworn and will not change his mind you are a priest forever after the order of melchizedek melchizedek is an interesting character in scripture He's kind of like the Tom Bombadil. He shows up, he does this thing, and then he's never really heard from again. So if you don't know who Melchizedek is, Melchizedek is a, someone that Abraham encounters in the book of Genesis. And Melchizedek is a really interesting name. It's uh, two Hebrew words, Melech, king, and Sadek righteousness so he's the king the righteous king and he rules over a place called salam or shalom he's the righteous king of peace and he shows up after abraham wins a military victory and abraham recognizes him as as a priest of the the one true God of Yahweh, and he, he offers him his tithe, his sacrifice. And Melchizedek receives it. And that's the end of Melchizedek. <laughs> <laughs> but the interesting thing about this is Melchizedek is referenced again in the book of Hebrews, just like it is here. He's, he's this figure that continues to come along because unlike the Levites, who were established as priests through the covenant of law, through God, Melchizedek was a priest before that. He is a priesthood that supersedes theirs because his is a priesthood that isn't written by law, isn't one that has to be made clean through sacrifices, through blood offerings. He's not a priest that has to make sure that he's worthy to walk in to the Holy of Holies before he can intercede for us. But not just a priest, he's a king. He's not just someone who intercedes on our behalf to God, but he's someone who brings the rule of God to the people. He has the authority to make it come about. So Melchizedek is this priest, king, who has a priesthood, that's set up by God apart from the law and that it reigns forever. And so when Christ is proclaimed as a priest in the order of Melchizedek, it's the same thing. He is a priest king. He is a priesthood that is not set up by sacrifices. He's not one that has to make sure that his own heart is good, that he has to offer his blood sacrifices, his burnt offerings, before he can then offer our blood sacrifices and our burnt offerings. There was no need for Christ to cleanse himself before he fulfilled his pre priestly roles. It's one of the reasons that the Levites had all sorts of bells 
and jingle things on their robes so that in case they were not clean and when they walked in, it interceded for God's people and struck dead. We don't have to worry about that happening to Christ. David gets a little dark again in verses five and six, right? The Lord is your, uh, Lord is your right hand. <clears throat> he will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will exalt judgment amongst the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. Again, this is one of those chunks of scriptures that kind of makes us squirm. It's kind of hard because we're so used to sitting in the new Testament of Jesus, this, this idea of, this Jesus who turns the other cheek, pray for those who persecute you, heap burning coals upon the heads of your enemies through loving them and doing kindness to them. This idea that when you are asked to do something, you go the extra mile, literally, literally right? We have this Jesus that is a king but we forget that he's a warrior king as well as a priest king. And on that day, when he comes in power and he's going to take the enemies of God and he's going to vanquish them, filling the nations with corpses. This isn't a God who is bringing death and destruction because it excites him. This isn't a God who's bringing death and destruction because it's not due. This is, again, divine justice. This is not vengeance. The wrath poured out upon the enemies of God is one that they are due because of their lack of faith in who he is. And this power, this victory from the Messiah over these kings, again, look at David's scripture, comes from God himself. A global judgment. And the death of the enemies of God should motivate us. <clears throat> this isn't something that we should read and take light. There are true consequences to belief and faith or lack thereof. And as much as we proclaim life and the life giver, which is true and it's what we want to do, what we want to proclaim, the reality that for those that are the enemies of God, death awaits, should motivate us, should motivate us to, to make that list as low as possible, right? To be doing all that we can to bring enemies of God into children of God, to make the dead come alive. Hopefully, after these couple weeks of going through Psalms, we'll have a better understanding of what the return of Christ means and will motivate us and push us to be better followers of Christ. David ends his psalm with this idea that after doing this, after bringing judgment on the nations and the enemies of God and, and bringing his power to reign, he's going to drink at the brook and lift up his head. He will be refreshed and he will praise God himself. It's a short little psalm. One that doesn't need a whole lot of unpacking. <clears throat> There's not any weird animals and visions to talk about. No statues. Just a simple, the king, a psalm of David that says the king is coming. And when he comes, this is what's going to happen. 
So how do we respond? How do we, as God's people, respond to the coming of the king? First way is our response would be we respond by longing for his return. The last several Christmases have been one that is that have been interesting for me because never have I been more dissatisfied than the Christmas time because as I focus on the first coming of Christ and the birth of the Savior, it turns my heart to long for the return of Christ in such a way that everything seems a little darker, a little less tasteful. My heart becomes dissatisfied in everything that's going on. And church, this should be our everyday life, a holy dissatisfaction to the way the world is around us. When we see injustice, when we deal with decay, man, when we have to put a new roof on our house because time just destroys everything. It should lead to a holy dissatisfaction in our hearts to long for the return of the king. Not only does, should, should we be longing in him, but, but that should, should push us into missions, into actions, right? When, like, when we proclaim the return of the king, we, we're proclaiming that Christ will come back and reign and judge, and there will be blood. There will be death. And that should motivate us, that should push us so that every conversation we have, every person we interact with is, is someone that, that could be on the list of the enemies of God, but we, we have a responsibility as his people. God commissioned us to go and share the good news, right? So the return of the king, as we long for it, should push us into missions and actions and longing for his return should turn our hearts to trust him with our desires, with our hurts. Last week we talked, I talked about how I have a list of things that I keep, injustices I've encountered, things that break my heart. And in this list, I use as a tool against God. I go, God, not only if you're good, not only can you make these things right, not only do I trust you to make them right, you have to make them right because you're the only one who can. So I have to trust him because there's nothing I can do about some orphans in Ethiopia that never got to be with their family. There's nothing I can do about children having to know the sound of air raid sirens and bombs falling on their homes. There's nothing I can do about children having to know the pain of true hunger. but I serve a king who's coming and he has to make these things right because of who he says he is. And I long all the day for his return. Second way we can respond is by taking Paul's words and to the, to the church in Colossians, to heart. We focus, we respond by focusing on the things above. Paul writes in Colossians, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Paul goes on to fully to elaborate out kind of what that means. One of the things he says is that when we focus on the things above, we put to death that is the desires of the flesh. Immorality he has a whole list. You want to go and read it in Colossians three. 
but we put to death our sin because we are raised with Christ because Christ died and his death is an impute to us so that sin no longer has a hold on us. Like in, we talked about in the book of Romans, right? Sin doesn't even know who we are anymore. And so when we respond to the Messiah, to the King of Christ, we put those things to death. We, we turn our focus away from those things, from, away from the self-idolatry that leads us to sin. And instead, we turn our attentions and our desires and our focus towards the King. And when we focus on the kingship of Christ, it means a lot of things have to change, right? When we focus on Christ being the king of our life, that means people, not just are we living a life that is making the most of Christ through our obedience. Not only do we acknowledge that we are not our own, but we are subjects of the Messiah, we are subjects of the King and that we live accordingly. We walk in obedience to the scriptures, to what Jesus taught because he's our King and we are his. But also when we focus on things above, not on things below, it has a large impact on the things we spend our time talking and dealing with, right? If I know more about your political stances, and more your thoughts about a given presidential candidate candidate and not about your feelings towards the king, you're doing it wrong. I'm doing it wrong. If you know more about the sports teams I follow and I care more about the scores on Sunday, I'm doing it wrong. And I'm not saying you need to be a monk. I'm not saying that you have to live a life that is devoid of entertainment, devoid of sports or movies or books or whatever those things are. But we need to be people that bring ourselves under the authority of Christ and proclaim his kingship. And part of that is this idea that no matter what happens, no matter what world government is in charge, no matter who is sitting in the Oval Office, there's only one king. There's only one person that deserves my allegiance, my time, my effort. There's only one person who can right the wrongs that we face, who can change the way the world is, and it's not a man, but it is the God-man, King Jesus as we enter into another great contentious political cycle, we as the church have a great opportunity to once again proclaim, just like we studied in the book of Daniel, right? That Christ and Christ alone is king. We respond by longing for his return. We respond to the psalm, to the kingship of Christ by focusing on the things above. And we respond by taking refuge in him. Again, Christ isn't just this king. He's the priest king. He's not just sitting enthroned in heaven at the right hand of God, waiting for his enemies to made, be made a footstool, but he is sitting enthroned in the power of God to intercede on our behalf. He has intimate access to God. And Paul talks about in Ephesians that we are seated in the heavenlies with Christ. Once had a teacher talk about the vision of the Greek is that we are like just seated, you know, we're sitting on the lap of Christ as he is seated next to, next to God. He's enthroned and we are just sitting on his lap, just stacked up. We have access to a priest with intimate access to God. That should bring us refuge. He intercedes on our behalf. Scripture goes on. He doesn't just intercede for us. He doesn't just take our prayers and and offer them a second time. But he intercedes in a way that we can't even begin to grasp, in ways that we don't even understand with 
groans and desires. This is, there's a fullness of this intercession. We have access to God. We are interceded for by a priest who knows us better than we even know ourselves. And this priest is not a powerless priest, but he's a king priest and he defends his people as he intercedes for them. We serve a king who is coming to make things right, to defend his people. Amen. That means as we walk this world and we encounter injustices, when we are attacked because we proclaim the kingship of Christ in a world that hates him, we can take refuge that he is coming and will come to defend us. He intercedes, he defends, he is the Messiah. So church, the band's gonna come up and, and we're gonna have a time to reflect upon this, this truth, the kingship of Christ. And, and maybe this is a time that you need to look through how you respond. Maybe you need to spend some more time and, and you, need, you need to pray for God to, to raise a longing in your heart that you he raises inside you this holy dissatisfaction with the way the world is and, and, in, in a, in a, and in a desire to see it as it was made to be. This recreation, this new paradise. Maybe you take, take some time praying that God would help you focus on the things above and put some of these distractions aside. The things that keep you from living and breathing fully for the Messiah. Or maybe this has been a difficult week. It's been a long year. And you need to take some time to find refuge in him, to pray, to ask the priest to intercede on your behalf to, the, to not only to God, the God man, Jesus Christ, the King, but to the God of the universe. Maybe you need to take some time to trust to find refuge in him. And after you do that, there's really one last way to respond to the King, to the Messiah, and that is through praise, to sing and lift your voice because we serve a God who is not forgotten about us, but is actively working to defend us, to intercede for us. And he has promised that he is going to come and make things new and right. And that should lead us to a wonderful chorus of praise because our God is not dead, but he's alive. God, we pray that, that your kingship, that your authority would be made manifest in our life, that it would prov provoke us towards obedience, God that would provoke us towards trust, that would provoke us towards seeing you, seeing your kingdom made manifest in our life, in our sphere of influence. God, I pray that we would become a people who are marked by our love and desire and devotion for you. God, may we draw a deep, lasting hope because you God who is reigning and that your kingship is eternal and that you will return to defend your people to right injustices and to make things as they were always meant to